If you have your Bibles, please turn to Acts chapter 25. Um, We're going to be going through Acts chapter 25 and Acts chapter 26. So we have two chapters to get through today. Um, Like before, like we did last week, I won't go reading two chapters and make you all fall asleep and then try and preach. We'll uh, go through it as we go. We broke it up into sections. Um, But what we want to talk about uh, really quickly is the trial we covered last week when Paul stood before Felix the governor and the Jewish representatives who had traveled to Jerusalem, although the representatives that came to Jerusalem weren't those who were directly accusing Paul, that trial ended in Felix not finding Paul guilty of anything that would constitute death or captivity. However, Felix likely worrying about the future uprisings and seeing an opportunity to possibly extort money from Paul in the form of bribes kept Paul on house arrest for two years. And it is this point that we pick up the removal of Felix, the governor, and the appointment of the new governor, Festus. And as we see, this new government appointment will move forward the divine plan to relocate Paul to Rome. We see that God's hand is in the rising up and the setting down of rulers for his divine purposes. Okay? We see that Felix was in no rush to move Paul along the political ladder upwards. Um, he wanted to keep him there to try and extort money. God telling Jesus, Jesus the Lord telling Paul directly that he would be making a testimony in Rome, saw fit to remove Felix and place Festus in charge. And so that came now to Acts chapter 25. And in Acts chapter 25 and 26, what we have are what I call the appeals. See, we've had a trial, we've had a a verdict. Paul is not guilty, but yet he is still on house arrest because there's there's still confusion, okay? But ultimately, there's been a judgment from the governor that he found nothing to kill Paul for, or really keep him in captivity other than the corruption itself of trying to extort money. And so when Festus comes in, he has Paul, this prisoner who's been there in house arrest, uh, remember, in Herod's place, uh, and he doesn't know what to do with this guy, Paul. But again, what we're going to see is we're going to see in these next two chapters, several appeals. We're going to see first the Jewish legal appeal, Okay, and then we're going to see Paul's appeal in response to that appeal to Caesar. Then we're going to see Festus's political appeal to King Agrippa. And then we're going to see, finally, Paul's appeal to the soul. And what we see here is that Paul is going to flip the script on all of these leaders and rulers and everybody else that he is going to stand before in chapter 26. And so what we see here is we see first and foremost in Acts chapter 25, we're going to see the Jewish appeal. Let us read Acts chapter 25, starting in verse 1. Now three days after Festus had arrived in the province, he went up to Jerusalem from Caesarea. And the chief priests and the principal men of the Jews laid out their case against Paul, and they urged him, asking as a favor against Paul that he summoned him to Jerusalem because they were planning an ambush to kill him on the way. Festus replied that Paul was being kept at Caesarea and that he himself intended to go there shortly. So so said he, let the man of authority among you go down with me, and if there's anything wrong with the man, let them bring charges against him. After he stayed among them not more than eight or ten days, he went down to Caesarea, and the next day he took the seat at the tribunal and ordered Paul to be brought. And when he had arrived, the Jews had come down from Jerusalem, stood around him, bringing many and serious charges against him that they could not prove. Paul argued in his defense, neither against the law or the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar have I committed any offense." But Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, Do you wish to go up to Jerusalem and there be tried of these charges before me? But Paul said, I am standing before Caesar's tribunal, where I ought to be tried. To the Jews I have done nothing wrong, as you yourself know very well. If then I am a wrongdoer and have committed anything for which I deserve to die, I do not seek to escape death. 
But if there is nothing to the charges against me, no one can give me up. I appeal to Caesar. Then Festus, when he had conferred with his council, answered, To Caesar you have appealed, to Caesar you shall go. So what we see here is that, again, when Felix is replaced, Paul's Jewish accusers decide to appeal the case that they lost when they were under Felix. Okay, And they, they want to appeal this case for Paul under this new authority. The appeal from the Jews was a front, essentially, for a second attempt to kill Paul. We talked about last week how they, they plotted that four, over 40 men committed to even either eat or drink until Paul was dead. Now we're two years later, I'm pretty sure they broke that vow. But two years later, we still see the fervent desire to kill Paul from these Jews. Okay? And so what we see here is that this, this appeal essentially is a way to try and get Paul back to Jerusalem so they can kill him on the way. We can see that Paul's generous house arrest in Caesarea, again, was actually a providential provision of protective custody against the murderous intentions of the Jews, as well that can be seen as a quasi-forced Sabbath or forced rest in light of his unfailing ministry service in the years past and great tasks in the years ahead. We talked about this last time. What, what this opportunity gave Paul was the opportunity to preach the gospel before kings and leaders, also the opportunity to have time to write to churches. Paul didn't stop his ministry just because he was on house arrest. He wrote several letters during this time that would go out to the churches and thus be included in Scripture today so that his encouragement could encourage us as well. We see that Festus then reopens the, the trial in Caesarea, we do not know if he knew about the intentions of the Jews or not to kill Paul. Either way, he refused to grant their request for a change of venue. You see, not only did they want to remove Paul from Caesarea and bring him back to Jerusalem so they could kill him along the way, but their, their thought is, is we want to bring him back to Jerusalem because Jerusalem is a favored area for us, and we feel like we would have a, a better result legally if it was in our favor. That's what a, a change of venue is is when a, a lawyer says, you know, I, I really can't defend my client here because everybody around here is biased against him. And so we need to change the venue. We're going to get where, you know, we're going to go where nobody's heard of the case. Nobody knows what's going on. We can have a favorable verdict. And so that's essentially what we see here uh, is Festus is not going to allow the change of venue, not going to allow that to happen, thus thwarting their plans to kill Paul. But the outcome of this reopened case, uh, this reopened trial, was the same. The Jews offered many accusations for which they could not prove. And Paul confidently rested in both the evidence, namely that the Jews didn't have any, and the case of his apparent integrity. Paul has been honest and forthright and not lied at all or perjured himself. And then Paul then, seeing that there, there is no further case uh, that's going result that's going to allow him to continue to um, move towards Rome. Paul then appeals his case to Caesar. He, Festus asks him, "Are you willing to go to Jerusalem?" He's like, "No. Uh, you're the governor. Going backwards isn't going to solve the problem." Okay. Again, not we don't know if Festus knew, but Paul understood that he would likely be murdered along that journey. Paul understood that. Uh, the desire to go back to Jerusalem from the Jews wasn't going to benefit him in any way. So Paul said, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to be judged. I appeal to Caesar. Paul likely deducing the plot to kill him demands to stand trial before Caesar. Again, Paul didn't want to go to Jerusalem. Paul wanted to go to Rome. Okay, so that's the direction. Why was that direction? It's the direction because that's what was decreed by the Lord Jesus. If we go back a couple of weeks, we see that the Lord Jesus himself said, you will testify about the truths about me to Rome. And so he appeals to Caesar, which was the right of every Roman citizen to have his case heard by Caesar himself. And after the initial trials and appeals had failed to reach a satisfactory decision, this was in effect an appeal to the Supreme Court of the Roman Empire. See, Paul was appealing specifically to Caesar Nero, actually, at this time, who was later an avowed enemy of Christians. When we think of Nero, the great persecutor of the church, this is who Paul is appealing to. 
Now, uh, the first five years of Nero's reign, there wasn't a lot of large influence that he was uh, going to be such an enemy of Christianity. Nero was regarded at the beginning of his ruling as a wise and just ruler. So there was no reason at this time for Paul to believe that he was going to be anti-Christian. But again, remember, Paul's thinking is making, in the making this appeal is he's convinced that the evidence is on his side. And because he senses that perhaps there is, his current judge is sympathetic to his accusers, he makes the appeal to Caesar. And so what we see here is there is a, an opportunity to, to make appeals to a higher authority. There are opportunities where the process, the, the legal process will help the gospel along and God will use that process. Let's continue on Acts chapter 25, starting in verse 13. Now when some days had passed, Agrippa the king and Bernice arrived at Caesarea and greeted Festus. And as they stayed there many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, this man left, uh, this man left prisoner by Felix, and then I was in Jerusalem, and the chief priests and the elders and the Jews laid out their case against him, asking for a sentence of condemnation against him. I answered them that it was not custom of the Romans to give up anyone before the accused met the accusers face to face, and had an opportunity to make his defense concerning the charge laid against him. So when they came together here, I made no delay, but on the next day took my seat on the tribunal and ordered the man to be brought. And when the accuser stood up, they brought no charge in this case of such evils as I suppose. Rather, they say, had certain points of dispute with him about their own religion and about a certain Jesus who was dead, but whom Paul asserted to be alive. Being at a loss to investigate these questions, I asked whether he wanted to go to Jerusalem and be tried there regarding them. But when Paul had appealed to be kept in custody for the decision of the emperor, I ordered him to be held until I could send him to Caesar." Then Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear from this man myself. Tomorrow, said he, you will hear him. Verse 23. So on the next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp, and they entered the audience hall with the military tribunes and the prominent men of the city. Then at the command of Festus, Paul was brought in, and Festus said, King Agrippa and all who are present with us, you see this man about whom the whole Jewish people petitioned me both in Jerusalem and here, shouting that he ought not to live any longer. But I found that he had done nothing deserving death, and he himself appealed to the emperor. I decided to go ahead and send him. But I have nothing definite to write, my lord, about him. Therefore, I have brought him before you all, and especially before you, King Agrippa, that, so that after we have examined him, we may have something to write. For it seems to me unreasonable in sending a prisoner not to indicate the charges against him. And so what we have here now is we have Festus's appeal to Agrippa, what, his political appeal. He wants Festus to hear the case and, and help him figure out, okay, what am I exactly going to charge him with? This is a governor. This is somebody that's supposed to rule. And he still can't figure it out. And so he's appealing to King Agrippa. And we'll, we'll talk more about King Agrippa here in a second. So he explains the case involving Paul to Agrippa. He lays out the case before the king. Um, Festus, new to his post, again, perhaps unfamiliar with the Jewish traditions and customs, seems somewhat confused by Paul's case. Therefore, even though there was not enough evidence to convict Paul, the investigation continues. The case was probably confusing to Festus because of the lack of the concrete evidence, but of course, there wasn't enough evidence to convict Paul of the accusations against him because he had done nothing wrong. Okay? When there's no evidence, there's no crime, as the saying goes. This was reason enough for the acquittal, but yet again, Paul is not set free. But here we have King Agrippa and this appeal to King Agrippa. Well, who is this King Agrippa? Herod Agrippa II ruled an underkingdom of the Roman Empire to the northeast province, um, and he was reputed to be an expert in Jewish customs and religious matters. Now, what do we talk about when we say an under kingdom? He was appointed by the Roman government to keep the people in line. Okay, he was to keep the Jewish people in line, keep them from rioting, keep you know settle these 
these internal disputes amongst themselves so they don't have to bother the Roman government with it. And as long as there's peace, there's not a problem. So Agrippa was the, gov the government-appointed uh, ruler of the Jews under Roman authority. Okay? Uh, though he did not have jurisdiction over Paul in this case, his hearing on the matter would be helpful to Festus. A couple of things about uh, this King Agrippa. His great-grandfather had tried to kill Jesus as a baby. So this is the family we're talking about. His grandfather had John the Baptist beheaded. His father had martyred the first apostle James. And now Paul stands before the next in line of the Herods, Herod Agrippa. Do you think Paul might feel like, hey, he might not be very cordial to me? He had every right to think, oh, this is going to go well. But Paul is confident. Why? Because Jesus said he's going to Rome. And guess where he's not? He's not in Rome yet. He's in Caesarea. So Paul is going to get out of this. He's not going to be beheaded. He's not going to be attempted to be killed, at least now. Uh, what we're going to see is that Paul is going to survive the Herod family tradition of killing Christians. Bernice, though, was his sister, and some historians say that their relationship was incestuous. Um, so essentially what we have here is we have King Agrippa still following, following in the family footsteps of immorality in his rule. Uh, Herod Agrippa II didn't rule over much territory, but was of great influence because the emperor gave him the right to oversee the affairs of the temple in Jerusalem and the appointment of the high priest. The appearance of Paul before King Agrippa was more of a hearing and not a trial, as Agrippa didn't have jurisdiction over this matter. But what we see here is that Festus, again, is going to appeal to him politically so he can try and figure out what he's going to write to Caesar. So he makes an opening statement at the hearing of Paul before Agrippa. And what we see here is that after the examine has, examination has, or this hearing has taken place, he wants to have something concrete to write to Caesar. And he will use this to prepare that official brief for Paul's upcoming trial. But in the midst of all the pomp and pageantry, Paul is about to flip the script. While Festus, Agrippa, Bernice, and the rest watching believe that they are going to get to the bottom of the wrong that Paul has done, Paul is going to put them on trial before the gospel. Let us read now Acts chapter 26, starting in verse 1. So Agrippa said to Paul, You have permission to speak for yourself. And then Paul stretched out his hand and made his defense. I consider myself fortunate that this is before you, King Agrippa, that I'm going to make my defense today against all the accusations of the Jews especially because you are familiar with all the customs and controversies of the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, spent from the beginning among my own nation and in Jerusalem, is known by all the Jews. They have known for a long time, if they are willing to testify, that according to the strictest party of our religion, I lived as a Pharisee. And now I stand here on trial because of the hope in the promise made by God to our fathers, to which our twelve tribes hope to attain as they earnestly worship night and day. And for this hope I am accused by Jesus, by Jews, O King. Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem, not only looked up many of the saints in, locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. Paul... <clears throat> In this connection, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. Verse 13, at midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? 
Is it hard to kick against the goads? And I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said to me, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand up on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and a witness to the things which you have seen me and to those which I appear to you, delivering you from the people, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins, a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Verse 19, Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all of the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. For this reason the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day I have had the help that comes from God, and so I stand here testifying to both small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass. So what we see here, we're going to stop right here, and and we'll, we'll get back to that. What we see here is we see that Paul flips the script. See, he, the, the leaders and everybody that's in this, this auditorium, they think that Paul is on trial. They think that Paul is, is going to be the one being asked the questions. But in Paul's defense, he takes the gospel and puts everybody in that auditorium on trial for the gospel's case, specifically calling out King Agrippa. Though he was a prisoner, Paul was happy to speak before Agrippa. First, because he was pleased to have the evidence of his case examined closely by the highest officials, but also because he was pleased to preach the gospel to kings and rulers. In the auditorium of the city of Caesarea, Paul spoke to Festus, Agrippa, Bernice, the commanders of the Roman legion, and all the prominent men of Caesarea. This was a tremendous opportunity, and Paul was certainly happy for that opportunity. Remember, what we've been talking about is Paul is not taking these, opportuni- these, these situations where he's being arrested or he's being um, beaten. He doesn't see these as downfalls or, or marks against the kingdom work, but he sees them as opportunities. And so what we see here is he's happy for those opportunities. This was, in, this was a partial fulfillment of what the Lord had promised Paul. At his conversion, go forth, for he is the chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings, and children of Israel in Acts 9.15. Paul talks about his early life as a faithful Jewish Jew and Pharisee. Paul was born in Tarsus. We understand that. He, that he was, it was several hundred miles from Jerusalem, yet at a relatively young age, he came to live in Jerusalem. Not only that Paul was a faithful Jew, but he was also a faithful man among the Jews, living according to the strictest sect of the Pharisees. So he, he lays out his case for why he understands the prophet and the law, and why he understands the re- why he has hope in the resurrection of the dead. And then he flips the script here in verse 6. When Paul is as faithful, believing Jew confronts Agrippa for his lack of faith. Paul made it clear that both his heart and mind he remained a faithful Jew. His trust in Jesus was an outgrowth of his trust in the hope of the promises made by God, and he argued that for his hope's sake, I am accused by the Jews. He pointed out that that all that Moses was talking about, all that the law talks about, that is what he believes in, and he believes that Jesus is the outpouring, the fulfillment of that. Which is why when we share the gospel with people, we don't just want to start anywhere, start from the Old Testament, start from creation, start from the fact that that the law and the prophets demand a sacrifice for sin, because that's how God ordained it, and it's a beautiful picture of showing the gospel and and what happens on the cross in our substitutionary atonement, as we talked about last week, and so what we see here is Paul is rooting his defense, rooting the gospel into the Old Testament, Therefore, claiming that Jesus Christ is the Messiah of the Old Testament that should be followed. 
Being that Agrippa was an expert in all customs and questions which have to do with the Jews, he should have understood the belief that God could or would raise the dead. Jesus said, with God, all things are possible, Matthew 19, 26. Yet it should be especially easy for Agrippa to believe that God raises the dead, given some clear statements in the Old Testament, such as Job 19, 25, and 27, and the nature of God and the intuitive grasp of the eternal among the mankind. This, this idea that resurrection would happen or that there would be that God has the ability to raise people from the dead is not something that is a far stretch for the Jewish believer or for a Jewish Old Testament expert. Paul explains that at one time he persecuted the followers. Not only was he a great Jewish scholar, but he was also a great Christian persecutor. Before his conversion, Paul believed that he must persecute the followers of Jesus. Why? Because he believed that they were in error. He believed as Agrippa believed. He believed as the Jews who want to kill him believed, that the believers in Christ were in error. And so he felt he must persecute them. Some he imprisoned, some he killed. He says, some he had put to death. Some he forced them to renounce Jesus, compelling them to blaspheme. Unfortunately, these are tactics that are still used today by false religions and state-run religions to see Christi- that see Christianity as a threat to their power and control of people. This, this demand to blaspheme the name of Jesus, blaspheme the name of God, to renounce your faith. This, these are all tactics to imprison, to kill, to have killed. These are all tactics that still happen today. Paul later speaks of the great regret he had over his prior life as a persecutor in 1 Corinthians 15.9 and 1 Timothy 1.15. Perhaps the fact is that he compelled them to blaspheme Wade, especially on his conscience. To compel someone to deny what they believe is true in their heart, especially someone that is indwelt with the Holy Spirit. But what did he also say? He said, I cast my vote against them. This clearly implies that Paul was a member of the Sanhedrin having a vote against Christians who were tried before the Sanhedrin, as Stephen was in Acts chapter 7. I cast my vote against them. You see, when we cast a vote for something, we're saying that, yes, we agree. So when when Paul casts his vote to the persecution of Christians before his Damascus Road experience, what he is saying is, I am... 100% morally attached to what's going on under my vote. Now, that means something. We vote all the time. Not just every four years. We vote all the time. We vote with our dollars. We vote with our time. We vote with our resources. And yes, every four years, we vote for a leader of this country that represents a platform of his party. And my encouragement to you is to take seriously your vote in whatever arena that is in. Because what you are saying with that vote, like Paul with the persecution of the Christians, is I am morally okay with everything that this vote is going to represent. Paul, at that time, believed what he was doing was right. And he was morally okay for casting his vote for the persecution of Christians. So he's making the case here. He's telling Agrippa, hey, I understand. I know what's going on. I was once an adamant persecutor of the church. But then Jesus showed up. Then Jesus showed up. See, Jesus revealed himself to Paul on the road to Damascus. Paul talks about this. And he, he, it, this is Paul's fullest account of the experience of his Damascus road. He first noted, noted that he went on the mission of hate and persecution with the authority and commission of some of the religious leader, leaders who now accuse him. You see, Paul literally saw the light before he figuratively saw the light. Paul went to Damascus supremely confident that he was right. And it took a light brighter than the midday sun to show him that he was wrong. Paul repeats the words from Acts 9, 3 through 6. These words emphasize 
the personal appeal of Jesus, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? The misdirected nature of his persecution, why are you persecuting me, Jesus? And the folly of persecuting Jesus, why? Why are you doing that? I am Jesus, I am Lord. You can't persecute God. You have no authority over God. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. These words changed Paul's world. He immediately understood that Jesus was alive and not dead. He understood that Jesus reigned in glory instead of being damned to shame. He realized that, the pers- that in persecuting followers of Jesus, he persecuted Jesus himself. And in persecuting Jesus, he fought against the God of his fathers. You see, the, the Lord, when he illuminated Paul's life literally and figuratively, took the blinders off so that he could see that the God of his fathers, when they talked about the coming Messiah, were talking about Jesus. We continue on. Jesus called Paul to stand to his feet. This was a way to say, come now, let's let's be going. And the religious leaders sent Paul to Damascus for a purpose, with authority and commission, Now he must choose another purpose, the purpose of Jesus under his authority and commission. Paul was commissioned to be a minister, which means he was to be a servant of the things which he had seen and of the things which Jesus would yet reveal to him. The commission of the Christian is to serve the message of the gospel. Let me repeat that. The commission of the Christian is to serve the message of the gospel. Our testimony, like which Paul is giving now, the work that Christ has done for us becomes a valuable tool in this mission of the church. Paul was also called to be a witness of those things. The commission of the Christian is not to manufacture a compelling story or message, but to simply be a witness to what we see and experience. It's not our job to make such a thing as an entertaining show that that people might be awed and wondered by what we create, but rather to just give a witness of the work and power of Christ as shown in the scriptures and in the lives that he changes here on earth. Of those among us that, that are believers, the lives that are changed, that is the witness. That's what we speak to. We don't manufacture something or try and build something up. Jesus described the work that Paul would do at the moment on the road to Damascus. Paul was blinded by the great light from heaven. His eyes were not yet open physically, but Jesus sent him to open the eyes of others, both Jews and Gentiles. Jesus then told Paul four results that would come from the opening of eyes. Being turned from darkness to light. The world loves darkness. That's why they reject Jesus, because Jesus is the light of the world. And so what what Jesus said is that people's will be turned from darkness into to light, being turned from the power of Satan to the power of God, to receive forgiveness of sins, to receive an inheritance among God's people. See, this is how Jesus described his followers, his people, his family. They are the sanctified, set apart from sin and self, And they are sanctified by faith in Jesus, not by works or spiritual achievement, but by their connection of love and trust to Jesus. And so in this auditorium where Paul spoke was filled with all sorts of important people and dignitaries. But we may fairly imagine Paul was speaking these words with special attention on those focused towards Agrippa. This was an invitation to Agrippa to become one of those who are sanctified by faith in Jesus so that his eyes could be opened just as Paul's were on the road to Damascus. Paul is obedient then to Jesus. No one should disobey the God who revealed himself so powerfully. Paul made a strong case before Agrippa and all that there was to why he preached and lived the way that he did. That they should repent and turn towards God and do works fitting for repentance. Let's continue on. Um, Let's go back to... Uh, verse 20 of chapter 26, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all of the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds and keeping, their, keeping with their repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me, and to this day they, I have had the help that comes from God, and so I stand here to testifying both small and great. <clears throat> 
small and great, and that small and great referring to the important people and then all the lesser people that the important people brought in status and, and symbols, saying nothing but what the prophets of Moses said would come to pass, that this Christ might suffer and being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim the light to both our people and to the Gentiles. And so Paul is reiterating that it is going to be for the Gentiles. So that's going to be for the entire world, not just the Jews. And so he calls them that they should repent and turn to God and do works befitting repentance. This is a neat summary of Paul's message that Paul sets repent and turn to God close understanding them as two aspects of the same action is that we repent and turn to God. When we repent, we are literally turning away from sin. We are really turning our backs to sin and heading towards something. You can't go two ways on a one-way street. You need to repent and turn and, and go to God. Because if you're not going to God, then you're going the other way. One can't turn to God unless they do repent. And the actions confirm true repentance. Do works befitting repentance. The works are the outpouring of the regeneration that's happening within you because of the Holy Spirit, and you bear fruit. Paul summarizes his defense. Paul plainly, plainly states the truth of his case. It was only because he sought to bring the gospel of Jesus to the Gentiles that the Jews seized him and tried to kill him. It wasn't because he was political revolutionary or because he defiled the temple. We know both of those things are, are not true. During his more than two years of a confinement, Paul did receive help from God. Yet to that point, it wasn't help that released him. It was help that gave him opportunity and the ability to speak to small and great about who Jesus is and what Jesus had done. Paul also stated in his unswerving commitment to the same gospel because that gospel was based solidly on the word of God, the law and the prophets not the traditions or spiritual experiences of man. He, it was rooted in the fact that Christ would suffer and that he would be the first to raise from the dead and would proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. See, the three main points of Paul's preaching is this, is that Jesus died, that he was resurrected, and the preaching of the gospel to the whole world without respect to either Jew or Gentile. That was Paul's outline for any sermon that he gave. Jesus' death, resurrection to the whole world world. Let's read the rest of chapter 26, shall we? Starting in verse 24. And as he was saying these things in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, are you out of your mind? Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. But Paul said, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I'm speaking true and rational words. For the king knows about these things. And to him I speak boldly, for I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice, nor, that ha, nor for, notice, for this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, in short time, would you persuade me be, to be a Christian? And Paul said, whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. Then the king arose, and the governor and Bernice and those who were sitting with them. And when they had withdrawn, they said to one another, this man has done nothing deserving of death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free had he not appealed to Caesar. So Paul, as he had appealed to the soul of those that he was giving his witness, his testimony to, his defense to, appealed to their soul, asked Agrippa specifically, do you believe the prophets? It's kind of a double-edged sword because he just explained that Jesus came from the prophets and he's a Jew and man, he has to say he believes the prophets. And what did Agrippa say? What did the people do? What we see is we see the responses to the appeal, to the appeal of the soul. When a witness is shared, when the gospel is presented, when an appeal is made, and the word appeal means a serious or urgent request to be heard. So when we appeal with the gospel, there is going to be a response. When, when we appeal with the gospel, we're appealing to the soul we have a couple of responses. First, Festus asserts Paul is mad. 
And Paul responds. Paul was obviously an intelligent man, a man of much learning. Still, at this moment, Festus thought he was crazy. Saying with a loud voice among all the present, given Paul's conduct at this hearing, there's some reasons why someone like Festus might think Paul was crazy. First, though a prisoner in chains, he said he was happy. Second, he insisted that God could raise the dead. Next, he experienced a heavenly vision and changed his life because of it. Also, he was more concerned about proclaiming Jesus than his personal freedom. And he believed in a message of hope and redemption for all humanity, not only Jews or Gentiles. You see, when the gospel is properly proclaimed and lived, it will often sound like foolishness to the world. People said that um, if, if you have a hard time believing who Jesus is, that Jesus was either a liar or a lunatic, right? Well, we know that he wasn't a liar, and we know that he wasn't crazy. So what does that leave? He's Lord. He's Lord. But Festus here thinks Paul is nuts. He's gone off his rocker because he's talking all this crazy stuff about resurrection from the dead and lights in the sky and being blinded and... That's nuts. But again, when the gospel is properly proclaimed and lived, it will often sound like foolishness to the world. Paul put it this way, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. 1 Corinthians 1.18. But Paul knew that not only his gospel was true, it was also reasonable. God may sometimes act above reason, i.e. the supernatural miracles that he does through the power of the Holy Spirit, as we've seen all throughout Acts, but never contrary to reason. Festus recently came from Rome and perhaps didn't know much of what had happened with Jesus in the early Christian movement, yet King Agrippa did know. And Paul appealed to his knowledge of the open historical events that were the foundation of this Christian faith, this this way of following Jesus. And again, none of this was done in a corner. None of it was done in private. Paul's message was characterized by truth and reason because it was based on historical events, such as the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. These things were not done in secret, but open for examination. The historical foundation of Paul's message made it true. As for reason, it simply isn't reasonable to ignore or deny things that actually happened. Who Jesus is and what he did must be accounted for. You know, there is more historical, literal evidence that Jesus existed than many of the philosophers of Rome. There's more documented physical evidence. We have to understand that we can't just ignore the historical events that actually happen. Paul seeks to persuade Agrippa to become a Christian. Oh, I love this. Paul used Festus's outburst to appeal then to the king Agrippa. You see, what was Festus's response? You're mad, you're crazy, you're nuts. And so Paul then turns, takes that opportunity to turn it to Agrippa and direct it specifically to him, asking him, do you believe the prophets? Paul did this because he knew that if Agrippa did believe the prophets, true and re- truth and reason would lead him to believe upon Jesus. He wanted to connect what Agrippa already believed to what he should believe what he already believed about the prophets to what he should believe about Jesus Christ. With this, Paul brought the challenge and point of discussion directly to Agrippa. This is a good and often necessary part of the presentation of the message of the gospel of Jesus and who he is and what he did for us. Calling the listener to a decision. Do you believe? Does this resonate? Are you feeling the conviction of the Holy Spirit to know that this is true. When Paul called Agrippa to faith in the prophets and in Jesus, Agrippa refused to believe or say that he believed. We may say that Paul recounted the words of Jesus on the road of Damascus saying what a Christian is in, Acts, in verse 18, but Agrippa didn't want it. Remember, Jesus' mission for Paul was to turn people from darkness to light from the power of Satan to the power of God. Agrippa didn't want that. 
He didn't want to turn from darkness to light. He didn't want to turn from the power of Satan to the power of God. He didn't want to receive forgiveness of sins. He didn't want to place among God's people. He didn't want to become one of those that were set apart by faith in Jesus. Why? What stopped Agrippa short? Why was he almost persuaded to become a Christian? Notice what it says. In a short, Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? What stopped him? I think there were, there were a couple of things that, that stopped him. One, and it's what stops all of us today. Because we love sin more than God. One answer for Agrippa might be that the person sitting next to him, Bernice, she was a sinful, immoral companion. And he may have rightly realized that becoming a Christian would mean losing her and his other immoral friends, that he was unwilling to make that sacrifice. Why do we not turn to God in repentance? Because we love sin more than God. In that moment, we love sin more than God. That keeps so many people from realizing the truth of the gospel. Next, why, why, we, why Agrippa might have fallen short and why I believe that we fall short today, because we fear man more than God. You see, on the other side of Agrippa sat Festus, a man's man, a no-nonsense man, a man th who thought Paul was crazy. And perhaps Paul thought that I can't become a Christian, Festus will also think I'm crazy. Because he wanted the praise of man, he rejected Jesus. How many are influenced by the fear of men? We, we don't preach the gospel because we fear men. We don't talk about the good news because we fear what people might say. We fear men more than we fear God. Will you sooner let your souls perish than show your manhood by telling a poor mortal that you can defy a scorn? Dare you not follow the right, though all the men should call you to do the wrong? Oh, you cowards, you cowards, how you deserve to perish. You have not enough soul to call your souls your own, but to cower down before the sneers of fools. Spurgeon said that. The fear of men will paralyze us. The last thing that, that I believe was going on possibly in, in Agrippa's heart when he was challenged that, to be a Christian, it's because we don't want to give up our ego. See, in front of Agrippa was Paul, a strong man, a noble man, a man with wisdom and character, but a man in chains. Did Agrippa say, well, if I become a Christian, I might end up in chains like Paul, or at least have to associate with him? We can't have that. I'm too important. Spurgeon said this, Oh, that men were wise enough to see that the suffering for Christ is honor, that lost for truth is gain, that the truest dignity rests in wearing the chain upon the arm rather than endure the chain upon the soul. You see, we struggle with the fact that we would much rather, we would much rather keep our ego intact. We'd much rather fear man more than God. And we would much rather love darkness than light. We'd much rather love sin more than God. And it keeps us believers from being obedient, repentant believers of, of the gospel. It keeps non-believers from truly experiencing salvation. Paul declared his continued trust in the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he did not retreat from, from his stand one inch despite his long imprisonment for the sake of the gospel. And with dramatic gesture, Paul showed that even though he was in chains, he had more freedom in Jesus than any of the royal royalty listening had. That, 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 that response from, from Paul, whether short or long, I, want it, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might be such as I am. 
such as I am, that you would be a Christian, that you would believe in Jesus, that you would have the experience that I have with Jesus every day, that he is a comfort, that he is a strength, that he is a good and loving shepherd, that he is Messiah. But not that you just be like me and you would suffer, but that you would be like me and you'd be free to share the gospel. Next we see that... um, Agrippa admits Paul's innocence, yet still forwards him to Caesar. Paul's direct challenge was too much for Agrippa, Festus, and the others on the platform. It was getting too close, too personal, and they felt they had to end it quickly by standing up and ending the proceedings. Agrippa saw, also saw that there was no evidence offered to support the accusation against Paul, and he respected Paul's great integrity even while rejecting Paul's gospel. So Agrippa and the others pronounced a not guilty verdict. Paul could not be set free because he had appealed to Caesar. It seems that once an appeal was made, it could not be retracted. The appeal to Caesar and his subsequent journey to Rome at the empire's expense were also the fulfillment of the Holy Spirit's purpose, that Paul should go to Rome, Acts 19.21 and 23.11. This also answered the longstanding desire in the heart of Paul to visit the already present Christian community there in Rome, as we see him talk about in Romans chapter 1, verses 9 through 13. You see, when a witness is, is given the opportunity, when a Christian witness is given the opportunity to be presented before people, it will challenge people. It will engage people. You will get a response. Some people might think you're crazy. Some people might think you're getting a little too close, a little too personal, and I can't, I can't follow it. But we also know that there are times where Paul preaches the gospel and shares this testimony that people are saved and converted and they believe in the truth that is being said. You see, we should see the fulfillment of God's plan through all of these events. And I know it's been tough because we've been going over large portions of Scripture, mainly because Paul talks a lot. And we, we see that God's fulfilling, fulfilling of his plan through all of these events through the raising in lo- of, of governors and replacement of governors, to the, to the protection that he gives Paul. By his appeal to Caesar, Paul will have the opportunity to preach to the Roman emperor the way he had to Felix, to Festus, Agrippa, thus fulfilling the promise that Paul would bear my name before kings, Acts 9.15. So with this, now Paul is going to take a slow boat to Rome. Um, He's going to be traveling to Rome. And think about what just happened on on this level. He's before King Agrippa. He's before the governor. And there's a lot of pomp and circumstance. And all the wise people of Caesarea are coming to hear this guy Paul give a defense. And now he's going to go to Rome. And he's going to stand before Caesar. How many important people do you think hang around Caesar? How many important people hang around the city of Rome? Paul is going to have such great opportunity to make impacts with so many people, both large and small. Because in this culture, what what comes with important people? People that they believe are lesser, that take care of all the things they don't want to take care of. But Paul doesn't see them as greater or lesser. He sees them as people created in the image of God. And so that's my encouragement to us today is that as we go out and we bear witness to the works that God has done in our life and the gospel and the things that Jesus has done for the world, that we would take that message and we would take it out to a world where no matter who we're looking at, no matter who we're talking to, that we see somebody that's created in the image of God and needs that message of the gospel because God loves them. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, God, that you protected Paul, that you fulfill your word, that you are in control of kings and rulers, and Lord, that you give us the opportunity to preach the gospel and to give our testimony, to speak what you have done in our lives. Lord, we give you all the praise and all the glory. In your precious name we pray. Amen.